I think this is an existential moment uh, for journalists and for democracy. And I'm going to show you exactly why. And also look at, um, I hope you look back a decade from now and you're going to say that, that was the moment. Um, and show you how we fight back with data, right? I think if nothing significant is done by technology, um, democracy as we know it is dead. And you should know you're walking into your elections coming up. Why should you care about the Philippines? Um, I spoke with Chris Wiley, the Cambridge Analytica whistleblower, earlier this month. And he said that the Philippines, 100 million people, 100% um, of Filipinos on the internet are on Facebook. Facebook is our internet. We have zero rating. We get most of our news from Facebook. Our dystopian present is your future. Uh, Wiley said that they tested, even before Cambridge Analytica was born, they tested these manipulative tactics in the Philippines. And if it didn't work, no problem. If it did work, the word he used was they ported it to you here in the United States and to the West. So let me take you through the case study. Let's go, let's go to the presentation, please. So let's fight back with data, right? Um, you're familiar with natural language processing of quid. Those are relationship between words. I want to show you some of the social network analysis in the real world and how we can combine both of that. This is the reality we live with today. Um, way on this side, three years ago, our battle began. It's been a long three years for me. Uh, if you can make people believe lies are the facts, then you can control them. That was what I told Al Jazeera. Uh, Tim Snyder said something much better. He said, if you want to rip the heart out of a democracy, you go after facts. That's what modern authoritarians do. Step one, you lie all the time. Step two, you say it's your opponents and the journalists who lie. Step three, everyone looks around and says, what's truth? There is no truth. And then the last step, resistance is over because you don't know where to begin, right? It creates apathy. We've seen this in the Philippines. You're starting to see it in the United States. Here's what we saw from our data. In uh, August of 2016, we began gathering data in our, and we basically mapped our information ecosystem. And what we've seen is just these three things. Patriotic trolling, uh, state-sponsored online hate and harassment campaigns to silence and intimidate. The end goal is to pound you to silence. You flood the market with lies, uh, unlike the old days when you control it, right? Women were targeted, are targeted 10 times more than men in our, in our country. And there were three steps in the Philippines. You attack the credibility of whatever, whoever the target is. Doesn't matter if it's true, you just attack it exponentially. If you repeat it, a lie told a million times becomes fact. Use sexual violence, that's number two. You inflame the biases, fuel misogyny. This was a tactic done against Senator Lila DeLima. She's been in prison for two years with six days of trial. It's a tactic that was used against me. Third, hashtag, hashtag her arrest. That's what they did. Hashtag arrest Lila DeLima. A few weeks before she was arrested, it trended. Then she was arrested. Me, in May of 2017, they did try to trend hashtag arrest Maria Ressa. It didn't trend, and that was probably why they didn't arrest me until 2019. It still didn't trend, but they went ahead with it anyway. So the whole idea is astroturf bottom up. Then top down, the voice with the loudest megaphone always wins. Cement top down. In, my gosh. Ah, where do I begin? I've, I'm facing eight charges in the Philippines uh, over the span of three months. I was arrested twice this year um, in a five week period and I was detained once. All of that? just had to teach me anger management, you know, <laughs> because it just made me angry. So here's, here's this hashtag, arrest Maria Ressa, so you can see 
how it works. Because really, until you're targeted, you do not know how horrible it is. Um, hashtag arrest Maria Ressa, May 2017. This is the first content creator who came up with it. He admits he's paid, he works for the government. And look how funny it is. Rappler, this is after we released the first transcript between Duterte and Trump. Um, Rappler just made the Philippines a legitimate target of North Korean nuclear missiles. This is May 24th of 2017. It's ridiculous, right? It didn't trend, but people believe it. From there, it jumped to Twitter, and these are campaign pages. President Duterte was elected in May of 2016. Brexit happened a month later, then you had Catalonia, then you had Trump. Ipatawag na yan sa Senado, call her to the Senate. I was called to the Senate a few months later. Uh, this was a campaign page for President Duterte. Then it jumped to uh, an overseas Filipino worker, and this is again, two years before I was arrested. I can smell an arrest and possible closure of Rappler.com. They did try to close Rappler January 2018th. We're still alive. Uh, we keep fighting. Uh, then from there, it jumped to, this is the sexual harassment part. <laughs> um, sorry, I have a cold fighting. Uh, David says, maybe Maria Ress's dream is to become the ultimate porn star in a gangbang scene. It isn't, but you know, it's there, <laughs> it's there. And then here on the Facebook page of Rappler, me to the RP government, make sure Maria Ressa gets publicly raped to death when martial law expands to Luzon. We've had three years of martial law in Mindanao. It would bring joy in my heart. The last two are students. And when I posted them, so the only defense of a journalist is to shine the light. When I posted them, Dave, uh, Miguel, Miguel's uh, teacher, his school, contacted me. All of this trash on social media, the astroturfing, the manipulation, all of that comes back and has an impact on our values. I worry about that all the time. Um, so, so welcome to the world of Facebook in the Philippines. What happens? So, by August of 2016, we had started to put a database together. We looked at networks that spread lies, disinformation networks. We put it in a database. It's more than a terabyte in size now. And we could see here, you could see the very systematic attacks, sorry, very systematic attacks against news groups and journalists in particular. If you look here, this is January 2015 all the way to April 2017. And you can see Bayaran, which is this up top. You can see these are origin fracture lines in society. Bayaran means corrupt. So this is the first attack against media. It's, it's a fracture line. But during the campaign, which is right here, the campaigns happened here, and then Duterte was elected here. You can see how they pounded it, and then it became a solid line. The weaponization of Facebook happened after President Duterte took office, not coincidentally the month that the drug war began, a brutal drug war that ah, the UN says has killed at least 27,000 people in a little less than three years. Look at this, bias by Iran, biased and corrupt. So what did we do? We took all that data and put it in a database for my social media team. We actually had to send our reporters and our social media team to counseling because it was so bad at that point, right? Um, in August of 2016, I took this data and gave it to Facebook. I said, look, it's, this is like nothing we've ever seen before. And if you don't do something about it, you have US elections, Trump could win. Remember August 2016, it didn't seem like Trump could win at that point. After he won, Facebook asked me for the data again. <laughs> so in this one, what you see is the left side. That's, those are the URLs that spread, that spread the fake news, right? I hate to use that, that spread lies. So this is where the lies happen. The middle is, there. those are the Facebook profiles and pages that spread the URL. 
And then you can look, it turns red when the average reposting is more than 10. After we published our first propaganda war series, I was hit with at least 90 nine zero hate messages per hour. If you've never, I've never felt anything like this, and I used to be a war zone correspondent. I'd walk into a war zone better, eat faster than I would walk into our world today if I had the choice. Um, so take a look at what happened in October of 2016, which is exactly when we published our first series. It turned almost completely red. If you can take a look, I focus on Sally Matai. This is a, a Facebook account that was attacking all the news groups. And when you look at exactly what it posts, it's a cut and paste account. This is astroturfing, right? It's fake grass. It makes you feel the bandwagon effect that doesn't exist. Uh, and then you can look, where does it actually cascade? It's the campaign pages and it just, this is a full-time job if you just look at this, right? So for my social media team, when they see this, they'll block it and we'll report it. But guys, 90 hate messages per hour, we couldn't report every single one, right? This is where we're frenemies with Facebook because they need to do more. We're still a, a fact-checking partner. Let me show you um, what it looks like in data. This is an attack against our vice president, Lenny Robredo. Our vice president comes from the opposition party, um, and she's been attacked very consistently in the last three years. Doesn't look like anything when it's like this, right? Let's put it in a network map. This is what it looks like. And it's the same network that attacks journalists, human rights activists, and it is so planned and organized and systematic that you can see, they've broken down the content creators, these are the three of them, they've broken them down by demographics. For the motherland is a content creator who is pseudo-intellectual, I will say, it doesn't quite make it to intellectual. Uh, Thinking Pinoy targets content for the middle class, and then the Mocha Usan blog is a former singer-dancer. She, she campaigned for the president, now she's held two government posts. Her first one was to head social media for the presidential palace. So she is the mass base account. This is the same network that attacks me and Rappler, but this is the network map that came from that map, the, the data that you saw. All of those dots are Facebook pages. This is the foundation of our information ecosystem in the Philippines. From there, it jumps to traditional media. Something similar happens to the United States as well, right? So in traditional media, it jumps to the Manila Times. Um, if you read the New York Times today, they describe one of the latest attacks of Manila Times against Rappler, where I'm supposedly a coup plotter. It'd be great to have a military to plot a coup, you know? Um, anyway, so the Manila Times, it's owned by a person who's been appointed by President Duterte to head international public relations for him. That works hand in hand, especially in the attack with, with Lenny Robredo, with our vice president, with state media. And state media, our state media has just said that they're sending their folks over to Russia and China for training. Uh, and then you just cap that whole thing by appointing the content creators to office. They work for the government. So that's kind of a tough thing to deal with, right? That's our information ecosystem. That is the propaganda war that we have to deal with. What this means is that these lies that make people doubt the facts, that seed what the government pushes top down, it's very easy to then file to, to weaponize the law, which is what happened to us, and a year after the astroturfing on social media, President Duterte in his State of the Nation address, not in a press conference, in his State of the Nation address, then said that uh, Rappler is owned by Americans. You know, I tweeted immediately, Mr. President, you're wrong, but in this chaotic landscape, it's really difficult. Historical revisionism is something else that happens. Astroturfing on social media, it's not just the posting, it's in the comments. And look at the comments, different accounts that 
it's not about making you vote one way or the other or choose one path over the other. It is a behavioral modification system. And we are Pavlov's dogs. I mean, if you look at this, look at how tiny it is. It's just to make people doubt that martial law, 21 years of Ferdinand Marcos, was bad. Here's what we did with quid, and this was so interesting to me because it showed me, so the map I showed you were all social network analysis. This map is the relationship of the words, natural language processing. This came from the first time I got an arrest warrant. This was December 2018. And what's interesting is the government did a press release and they said, you know, I can't remember which charge. There's so many of them. There are 11. Um, so I couldn't remember which one, but Quinn told me that 34% of the stories came from the Philippines and 27% from the United States. What was so interesting is when you put that together with what they wrote about the topic of it, right? And you can see that the blue focused on my arrest, that I was going to be arrested, but the red was about the crackdown, that it is a rights crackdown. And guess what? Filipino newspapers and news organizations essentially stayed true to the press release of the Philippine government, while the news groups outside were the ones who made the call to say it's a Duterte rights crackdown. That's interesting. I wouldn't have known that if I didn't, if I didn't process the actual words that were written, right? Here's what our information ecosystem looks like. This is now our social network analysis from Rappler. Asymmetrical warfare, very similar to what you have in the United States. That small little circle up on top are trying to fight back, but the, the major part of our information ecosystem is pumped full of propaganda, of poison, right? The pro-Duterte communities actively share and spread each other's content. This is coordinated. And they are trying to create something that you know, was just taken down, similar to, I guess, what an Alex Jones. They're trying to create alternative sources, <sighs> alternative reality. This is what happened when I got arrested the first time. It was the day before Valentine's Day, so I remember it. It was my government's Valentine's Day gift to me. Look, it was almost equal. <laughs> and the sizes of the circles are eigenvector centrality. So the larger the circle, the more influential the account, right? If you look up on top, the anti-Duterte clusters share traditional news groups, while below, the pro-Duterte, pro-Marcos clusters, they work together and they share alternative news sites. They're trying to create Mocha Uson blog as one, but not quite as good as Alex Jones was. So it's still, they're in search of somebody who will, who will be able to fill that role. But, you know, the joke, of course, within Rappler is, Maria, you should have been detained longer than a day. I'm like, thanks, guys. <laughs> I know. Anyway, so um, let me show you what it means for a news group, right? We're a startup, and I'm, I want to leave time for questions. So I'll just leave you with this, right? Please don't forget the Mueller report. You're already going through this, but Russian disinformation has been proven. It, it pounds the fracture lines of your society on both sides of some of the hot topics, hot issues that tear our society apart, right? What we did in December last year when the Senate Intelligence Committee released the data, we took our data bottom up and found our connection to it. It is global and the nervous system runs through social media. I will just share this later on. I want to leave it with where we are today. Here's our world today. I started with Tim Snyder, right? You combine with online and offline violence to create a climate of fear. This is what we're living with in the Philippines. Anyone who questions this brutal drug war supports anyone who supports those who fight for truth. You attack them with the full force of the Philippine government. Make them cautionary tales for anyone demanding truth. 
When I first got arrested, one of our young reporters was live streaming the event. <laughs> I was an event. Um, they were live streaming, and the arresting officer went next to her and said, shut that down. She refused. She was still live streaming it. Then he took her hand, and then he said, be quiet or you're next. That's the end goal. Be quiet or you're next. So don't be quiet, please. What do we need to do? Obviously, we have to do something about technology, which has acted as the accelerant. Except quid. <laughs> quid, quid is actually giving you a landscape analysis, right? It's not a behavioral modification system. That's the biggest problem that we're running into with social media today. And mind you, I am both a fan and a critic of Facebook because Rappler couldn't have grown exponentially without Facebook as well. The biggest problem now is this social media platform cannot expect to be the world's largest distributor of news and leave behind the most important gatekeeping role that journalists used to have. Right? So what do we do? Start with the area of influence. This is what we can do now. Demand accountability from power. Stand up against bullies. Report the lies. Tell your family and friends. Courage spreads. We begin by taking care of what's in front of us. It's not just Rappler in the Philippines. I'm going to leave you with a one-minute video of journalists who hashtag hold the line. Have you ever been harassed because of your work? Yes. Have you been threatened online? I oh. Have you been called biased? Yes. Have you been called stupid? Yes, plenty of times. By idiots. Have you been called disrespectful? Yes. Have you been accused of corruption? Yes. Have you been called ugly as a response to any story? Yes. Have you been called fake news? Oh yeah, they always say I'm fake news. Anything that's critical is fake, right? Have you been accused of being an imperialist spy? <laughs> yes. Have you been accused of being a communist operative? Yes. Have you been accused of working for the CIA? Yes. Have you been sexually harassed as a journalist? Yes. Has your family been threatened, harassed, or alluded to? Yes, uh, it has. Uh, specifically, my daughter, when she died, uh, there were a lot of people who made fun of that. Have you been threatened with rape? Yes. Yes. No, not me, but my family. Have you been threatened with violence? Yes. Have you been threatened with death? Yes. Have you been told how you're going to be killed? Yes. Has the violence been described to you? Oh, yeah, blow my head off. Uh, or bury me alive. What will stop you from reporting? Nothing. 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 Death? You have to kill me. I think more than at any other time, this time tells us information is power. And the facts are critical to our democracy. What, you, you mentioned that Facebook, that you were both a fan and a uh, um, critic of Facebook. They recently refused to take down misinformation. Do you have any influence? Um, at what point do, have they lost their right to own the conversation? Um, so Rappler is one of two Filipino fact-checking partners of Facebook. And uh, if you only look at the content, it is a whack-a-mole game, right? But what we do is once we find the lie, we then look for the network that spreads the lies. And then we come back and say, here, it's identifying it like a terrorist network. I saw what Facebook has done. Um, gosh, <laughs> any journalist in here? <laughs> look. You can't be the world's largest distributor of news. You can't be in charge of the public sphere if you do not protect the facts. I think that's really simple. I saw the most recent one where they said, you know, it's like a broadcaster and television ads. Well, even television ads are governed by rules yeah. about whether it's factual or not, right? I think what we're watching in real time is Facebook's evolution a little too slowly, but it's evolution from atomizing 
the world, right? This content moderation ecosystem, which any journalist would say would fail to begin with, right? How can you atomize uh, making a decision about whether something is factual? Uh, but it is, it's what made sense when automation and technology was the driver. Now we see the impact on the world, on democracies around the world. If you look, 2017, Freedom House said at least 27 countries around the world had cheap armies on social media rolling back democracy. The next year, Oxford University's Computational Propaganda Research Project brought that number up to 48, and this year that number is almost 90, I believe, right? So this is, that's why I say it's existential. I give you the Philippines as a case study. Um, the United States is also a case study. And for whatever reason, um, we tend not to look at tech. We tend not to cover tech enough, partly because it's so new, right? But I guess I look back um, if we go back to history, let's think about it like the 1920s, the age of industrialization in the United States. Those very same, the Rockefellers, the Carnegies, those very same people who took advantage of industrialization of, of labor at that point, they're the same ones who later on came back and gave, donated a lot of money to make up for how they wreck society during a period, the sweatshops, right? Sorry, I speak very frankly. Oh, I, um, but the quick answer is, let's all nudge Facebook to be stronger, to be faster, to protect the facts. The evidence is clear. Hi, um, I guess on behalf of all of us, I really just want to start by saying thank you. I think that in the US, um, I know that I have, and I'm sure a lot of people could have take for granted like the role of the free press because it's been, it's been one way most of our lifetimes and maybe the generation before. So um, I mean, thank you for being on the front lines and something that's so dangerous. Um, I also had a question. So sure. I've, I know I can't recall where I've heard it, but it feels like today when, when there's sort of like a war on truth or at least the question of like what is true, um, it can feel, or it, it can seem like, you know, coming back at a, a, an untruth with simply, you know, that's not true. I think it's, it's just showing that that's not, that's no longer the most persuasive way to, to change someone's mind. And I think, I, when I think about that, I, I think it's, um, I'm racking my brain to think of other ways. So I'm just wondering, have you encountered other persuasive methods besides, you know, well, that's not true when someone else when the person you're speaking to says, well, how do you know it's not true? It just kind of becomes a, an exercise in who can ask the most questions almost. No, I think you're right. And a lot of that, again, is because of this, this behavioral modification system that we're kind of sucked into. And it's, you know, media is also not exempt from that because we're part of the cascade, right? Um, the best answer I can give you is to go back to the former head of the KGB who became the head of the Soviet Union. He talked about disinformation. He said, disinformatia, when you go through it once or twice, you're okay. But if you have it, it's like drugs. If you have it, look at the irony of drugs, right? If you have it a lot, you get addicted and you fundamentally become a different person, right? So. We have two things when I think about how do we deal with this. The first is how do we stop, let's talk about lies as like a virus. How do we stop the entry of this? Because information warfare is going on and you are being manipulated. So first let's stop it. And then the second is what about the people who've already been changed by it? How do we do that? These two things have to happen simultaneously. Civic. Look, the United States is better than the Philippines because your institutions still work. Uh, our institutions collapsed. Um, in your case, you actually had midterm elections where people, civic engagement can still work. And I really, truly push you to work actively to protect your rights while you're still strong enough to have them. Um, what we're trying to do now in the Philippines is civic engagement dies without the facts because the engagement because you have these two different things going on. Um, I guess the first step now that we're trying to do as a news organization is to continue doing the stories and to continue shining the light. It's the only thing that we can do. 
does that, I didn't really answer your question because we've never been at a moment like this. That's why I think it's existential. And I really, you know, I, I spoke in Hamburg two weekends ago in front of 2,000 investigative journalists. And I think we all kind of just cried together because it's so, don't let this moment go by without acting. Because I think your democracy needs you. Keep, keep at it, right? Because at some point, if we can stop the poison or the virus from coming into the body politic, then we can begin to heal society. Before this time period, leaders worked to heal the divisions in society. But now we have, and you look again at Russian disinformation, it's about making you lose faith in everything so you don't act. That's how you introduce apathy. Remember on Facebook, on social media, and it's not just Facebook, but it's just Facebook is overwhelming in the Philippines, lies laced with anger and hate spread faster than facts. Boy, I'm really depressing you. I'm sorry, Bon Appetit isn't here. Um, remember, we can do something about it. I think that's the key part. I guess what I'm curious about is your opinion on so much of what we see on TV every day in the news is just lying without any repercussions. I mean, hopefully repercussions, but just like blatant lying. I appreciate like Washington Post always telling us another 13 lies today, things like that, but I just don't see what tangible, you know, what outcome is coming of that. And there are so many people, or at least on Twitter, who say like, stop covering these stories when we know that all that's coming from it is blatant lies that only fuel the fire of the people who choose to believe them. Yes. So what do you say to people? And I also appreciate when there's live fact checking, but that's also pretty rare. So again, to that point, it's kind of like after the fact, you can say that wasn't true, but the story's moved on. Yeah. And so just what's your thought on people who say stop covering these stories, don't waste airtime on people who you know are gonna lie? I don't think we can stop covering the stories because a lie told a million times becomes truth, right? Or Scary. becomes a fact. Um, I think about it like this. Uh, thinking fast, thinking slow, you know that book by Daniel Kahneman? Thinking fast, thinking slow. Thinking fast is your emotional reaction. It is our default. That's where we live on social media. It's not thinking, right? And then thinking slow happens afterwards. Thinking slow is where journalists live. Thinking fast is where social media lives, right? Mm -hmm. And most people are agitated to push. So I think first is, know you're being manipulated. Who likes to be manipulated? No one does, right? We should actually, before we focus on what's happening in the, me in the media, you know, we should really look at how these networks of disinformation are manipulating us. And then look at your own biases. I think that's, you know, it's not media literacy that we need. It's actually how to deal with this kind of emotional manipulation that is for sale to the highest bidder. Right? This is a problem, and this is part of the reason, you know, right now, if you think long-term education, sure, that's a solution. Medium-term, yes, maybe media literacy. But in the short term, only the tech, the social media tech platforms can do something right now. Um, gosh, I, I, again, I don't want to depress you, but in order to solve the problem, we need to know what the problem is. And that's actually what I'm waiting for from Facebook because we're partners, we're, they're partners. And I know some people inside, we work with some really good people. They're really smart. They were able to pivot Facebook within two years to mobile. It's been three years since I've been jumping up and down, you know. Um, but again, I can't lose hope because, uh, so, it goes back to thinking fast, thinking slow. When you're pushed to anger, look at what you're, what's pushing you to anger and then call it out. Maybe it'll force us to take a step back, right? Politics, unfortunately, is one of those trigger points. And as we've seen through, again, if you, when I read the Mueller report, the evidence is so clear of disinformation. And yet, we're talking impeachment, but Russia gets away with it, right? Oh, by the way, please do something in the United States, because where you go, we go. We're a testing ground, but without, 
please do something. <laughs> uh, just a really quick story. So back in the mid-2000s, I introduced uh, smartphones into the Philippines with Globe. And at the time, um, we saw the fast rise, of course, the adoption of Facebook. Yeah. In fact, actually, the brand I was leading was synonymous. Actually, folks actually thought we owned Facebook at the time. And when we talked about Facebook then, it was all about connecting friends, right. family, and businesses. And we actually saw that we pulled people out of poverty into the new economy using mobility and Facebook Absolutely. as a platform. I agree. And we were very proud of, of course, the fact that there was such a high adoption of Facebook at the time. You fast forward beyond then, and, and you saw the, uh, the Arab Spring and the utilization of social media then, and of course, mobility. And I think, for the most part, in a positive way. Now, as you're describing, and, and I'm actually quite very disappointed to hear what's happening in your country. It's very, very sad. Um, your thoughts on what's happened there, what's happening there, the pressures and challenges, and now there's another hotbed, which is Hong Kong. Can you share your thoughts there? Of course, China, having blocked Facebook and any of these kinds of social media platforms, they control completely, as you know, the social media platforms that come out of there. You've got this conflict between, you know, traditionally Western Hong Kong and communist um, China. Your thoughts? Wow. So first, geopolitically, right? Obviously, uh, President Duterte in October of 2016 went to Beijing and he announced, without letting our our foreign service know, uh, that the Philippines would pivot away from the United States to China and Russia. He added Russia then. China is coming in. Uh, we're in the process now of looking at these Chinese accounts linked to that first network. We've had six waves of disinformation networks now, and uh, the Chinese ones are just coming in in the last six months. Um, Hong Kong is uh, the, the fact that civic engagement is moving so fast. It's also connected to, to the economy, right? Because the, the kids who are going out are looking at where they're headed. Uh, and you can see that they're not giving up. Uh, but at the same time, you can also see the long-term impact of disinformation uh, on the way mainland Chinese and some Chinese in Hong Kong look at the push for greater freedoms. So this is actually playing out. Uh, it can show us where we're headed. Uh, the fact that Hong Kong, Hong Kong is a very unique place. They, China can't treat it like Tiananmen Square. It's too open. It's, and yet at the same time, you're already, I worry, you know, we look at the kind of like really stubborn uh, push for freedoms, and at the same time, what will that, what will that, what reaction will it get from the Chinese government? From the Philippines, we look at this, and you know, we we look at ourselves and try to figure out what happened to the country that coined people power. Where are we? And it's a combination. Um, I talked about the three C's of the Duterte administration: corrupt, coerce co-opt, corrupt, coerce, co-opt. And this works in business, in media. You know, the first is the incentives, corrupt, coerce, push, and then co-opt. So China is doing all of those in Hong Kong, and yet you still have a strong civil society. Uh, I think we have to keep watch over it. I'll tell you, part of the reason that I'm not in jail, and it was Amal Clooney who actually even figured out how many years in prison I could, I could be jailed for. She told me, 63 years, that's how long I could go to jail. And I mean, what can you do? You like develop gallows humor. My co-founders and I, one, one of them said, look, I'll bring you food. Someone said, I'll bring a fan. Um, we looked to Hong Kong for inspiration for civil society at the same time, that specter of China. Look, I think about um, what's happening globally. Russia is B to C, right? goes directly to consumer. China, so far, has been B to B. 
So the Chinese government, for example, cut a deal with the Philippine government to bring in the video surveillance that it has in China. That will fundamentally change the Philippines. So as long as we have our rights, our constitution is still in place, we'll continue fighting back. Sorry, the last point that I, I veered away from, which is if you're working for a news group here in the United States, I know your attention is torn in 10 million directions, but Hong Kong needs it. I couldn't have survived this long if the international media wasn't focused on our stories. I think the only reason I'm still out is I don't think the Philippine government quite knows what to do with me right now. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks, Dan.